Hello, everyone at Classical Archives. I'm Barry Lenson with the Classical Archives vlog. Um, today, it's my pleasure to be speaking with Frank Beck, who's a literary scholar. And we're going to be talking about a piece by Sir Edward Elgar called The Dream of Garantius. You know, for as long as I've been hanging around classical music, which is getting to be quite a while, I've heard about this piece, The Dream of Garantius, but I've always wondered what the heck it was. It seemed like a mystical work. It seemed like an oratorio, but it sounded kind of operatic. And I never really knew what it was. And then I found out that my old friend Frank, and who's also an old friend of classical archives, is a scholar and a great expert and authority on both the works of Elgar and also the dream of Garantius. So um, I'm excited to have him on so we can try to shed some light on the mystery of this work for all of us. Um, Frank is a literary critic. He's been reviewing poetry for the Manhattan Review for more than 30 years. He's also a translator who most recently, with Rolly Wittinger, published a translation of a novel by Lou Andrea Salome uh, called Annalisa's House. So again, most germane to our conversation is the fact that Frank is an expert in Elgar and Gerontius, and he also is on the board of, or you're a trustee of uh, the organization that's publishing Elgar scores in Great Britain, right? Yes. Again, welcome to uh, Classical Archives vlog, Frank. So I guess I'd like to start with just a very general question, you know, what what is the dream of Durantius? It's a good it's a good question, uh, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it because this is a work which is the most popular modern choral work in the UK. Um, in fact, among all choral works, it's second only to the Messiah. Uh, so it's capable of appealing to a lot a wide range of people, a wide audience, but. It's not well known in the United States, and and uh, we can talk a little about why that might be. But um, the fact is that the work came into uh, uh, being almost by accident. Elgar uh, had had a big success with a choral work called Caractacus. Caractacus was the leader of the British indigenous people who tried to fight off the Romans and didn't succeed. In fact, the, the work ends with the humiliation of these Britons being brought before the buildings of Rome in chains. This was a big success. It was followed by the Enigma Variations, an even bigger success. And Elgar was invited to write for the Birmingham Musical Festival. Really big deal. It was only held every three years, but it had been held since 1784. And it was a big honor. And he had an idea to write a very traditional Anglican oratorio all about the ministry of Jesus. And uh, everyone would have been very happy with that, except that they didn't give Elgar enough notice. And after a, a, few, a month or so of working on it, he contacted the festival and he said, there's no way I can have this ready. Uh, it's January. I'm supposed to have this written for full orchestra and chorus uh, in time for performance on, in October, we can't do that. And, and he said, so I'm gonna have to resign uh, my commission. And um, they said, well, you know, we don't really have time to find anybody else. Isn't there anything else that you mm -hmm. could do? And he said, well, you know, I love the dream of Grantius by Cardinal Newman, John Henry Newman. Uh, I've had that, it's a book length poem. I've had it for 15 years. I, uh, my wife and I both love the poem. Um, I'd love to set that. And, uh, they said, okay. But then he discussed it with his editor, August, um, Jaeger in London. And Jaeger said, you, you know, there's going to be a lot of problems with this, Edward. Um, there are a lot of references to the Virgin Mary, and that's not going to go over well with an Anglican audience. Um, and he said, how about we remove those? And 
Elgar's response was sacrilege and not to be thought of. <laughs> so uh -huh. they went ahead and set this work. And it is not an oratorio and, uh, um, because for a simple reason, an oratorio is supposed to present a story from the Bible. Or if you're a Catholic composer, you have a little more latitude. It could also uh, tell the story of a saint. But you can't tell the story of a common man. And Garantius, which is just the Greek word for old man, is simply an elderly everyman on his deathbed. The work is very simple and in a way in its structure. In part one, he's on his deathbed and a priest and his friends are uh, praying for him. He passes into the next world. And in part two, we hear um, his dream of what this might be. And both Newman and Elgar being Catholics uh, we're careful to say this is not what happens after you die, because that would be blasphemous. We don't know. Uh, if the Bible told us what happens after death, we would be glad to set it to music, but right. we don't have that information. And um, and so uh, that's why it's called the dream of Grantius. That's the dream. Part two is the dream of this man on his deathbed. And even if, you know, obviously people seeing the first performance didn't hear this interview first <laughs> but what happens is at the end of the towards the end of part two uh Grantius turns to the angel who his guardian angel and more or less says what is that sound i'm hearing and she says those are the people around your bed back on earth so we the part one impinges on part two and and we see the connection um you know it's a fleeting moment, but enough to allow Elgar to explain to people that he hadn't been daring enough to answer all the questions about life and death. <laughs> so. Boy, so it's, it's religious, but not, it, and it's Christian references, but it's not specifically Christian work. Is that right? That's exactly right. I mean, <laughs> George Bernard Shaw was a great fan of Elgar's music. Shaw was as far as you could get from a Catholic. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he would, a listener like Shaw would see the work as a, um, a metaphor for man's struggle to understand. And in fact, what happens, we'll get to this, but uh, Garantius' efforts to understand his place in the world and in the universe after death uh, have a pretty ambiguous outcome. And, and, you know, Shaw would be very, I think Shaw would have thought that that was very brave of Elgar and Newman to be so honest, not to have a, an easy answer. And, and um, that's why, in fact, since I touched on this, I think that's why this work hasn't really caught on in the United States, because we like religious works that, first of all, are are at one remove from our own reality, like the creation by Haydn, or the Messiah, or the Bach B minor mass. These things happen in a kind of Olympian world that we can admire and show, you know, experience a sense of reverence, but it doesn't really ask you any hard questions because it has all the answers already. Right. But Arantius, uh and this is why I think it's so popular. Remember, uh, in the UK, the UK has a state religion, which is Anglicanism. And you would think a, such a Catholic work would have uh, two strikes against it. But the British have really taken this to their heart. And they just, they ignore the theology uh, just the way somebody reading the Iliad ignores the theology of the ancient Greeks religion. It's just, you know, the, the focus is on the human beings in, in the Iliad. And the focus yeah. here is on um, is on Garantius, this one figure who is struggling. So um, when did you when did you first discover this work in your own life? You know, Barry, I've always been 
fascinated by the period from 1890 to um, 1914, when the First World War started, because I think it's really the crucible out of which the modern world came. And um, I was always reading literature about it and uh, seeing plays about it, listening to the continental music, which all of which I knew very well. I knew um, Mahler and Dvorak and uh, Tchaikovsky. And I mean, this is how little known Elgar was in the 1970s. I said, surely the British had a composer. Who was he? So I went to one of those big record stores down near 42nd Street that you remember. They were yes. the size of an airport, practically. And I made my way through the bins and I found sea pictures, a song cycle sung by Janet Baker, conducted by John Barbaroli. I took it home and I thought, how is it possible that I never heard this? This music is absolutely ravishing. And not only that, but it's very varied. There are five songs there and they, they, run the gamut from very simple arrangements to think to uh, a song Sabbath at sea, which is almost Vag Vagnaria. Um, and so I thought, well, I have to find out something more. And as soon as I started to research Elgar, I found out it just as by coincidence, the next opus number, Sea Pictures is 37, Garantis is 38. I was, <laughs> my first try was only one opus number off from the heart of Elgar's work. And so quickly I got the classic recording by Barbaroli um, with Janet Baker as the angel. And, uh, uh, you know, I fell in love with it. But one thing, you know, not only is this work popular in the UK, but the, you think about the conductors who have recorded it, John Barbaroli, Adrian Bolt, Benjamin Britten, uh, Simon Rattle, uh, Daniel Barenboim, Colin Davis, it, you know, it's attracted some very distinguished conductors. Uh, and it's not an easy work to do if a uh, uh, hundred minutes of uh, a double chorus, a semi-chorus, and a mahler size orchestra. So. And soloists, of course. Pardon me? And soloists, of course, and no, and yeah, not to, not to forget the three soloists, <laughs> and they and this is one problem in putting on this work. Uh, since the work is kind of unique, uh, what you have to do is find people with an operatic background who are willing to step outside of the comfort zone and do something different. And you know, uh, Janet Baker, because. She was not only an opera singer, but she was a singer of leader and all kinds of art songs. And, you know, if you go from um, uh, a Brahms song to a Mahler song, you have to you have to rethink your whole approach to singing a song. And, and she was able to do that. Uh, and of course, Barbaroli was a big Elgar advocate, and I'm sure as you probably know, he was also an amazing control freak. <laughs> he he was a cellist himself, and he would he would uh, write out the bowings for all the string players. Oh, wow! Before they re rehearsed the work, and so I'm sure when you're hearing Janet Baker's performance, you're hearing uh, some input from Barbaroli too, who actually knew Elgar and was one of the first people to record his music in the, the 1920s. Um, well, are there other works that are similar, or is this kind of out there in its own little peninsula of uh, of the arts? You know, sometimes people compare this to Death and Transfiguration by Strauss, but usually the, they immediately say um, that that's not a valid comparison for the simple reason that there's no choruses, there's no there's no chorus or no soloists and and it doesn't have the gravitas it's just it happens to be on the same theme um right so um you know opera d 
deals with death, but usually from this side of the grave rather than the next. Right. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. I mean, Tannhäuser starts in Venusburg and then comes to Earth, but but Venusburg isn't exactly the afterlife either. So it's right. It's interesting, it really is. Yes, but really, if you look at the the vocal parts, the soloist parts of Garantius, the writing has some affinities for uh, Italian opera, which uh, you know, Elgar liked Wagner's orchestration, but the singing that he was attracted to really was Italian, but starting with Mozart's Italian operas. But, you know, I think you can hear echoes of Verdi and Puccini in, in the soloist writing in Garantius. It ha and it has that feel that, you know, in a Puccini um, aria, just that complete identification with the, with the uh, character that the singer has to have. There can't be you, you can't get lost in the beauty of the notes. You have to go underneath that to the, the reasons why someone would sing those notes. It's interesting. This is, I don't know if this is worth discussing or not, but when you're talking about European music, hasn't, hasn't there always been something just a little bit other and a little bit different about British music, just all the way through history. I mean, starting with Henry Purcell, you know, a Baroque composer, but not like Handel and not like Bach, really walking his own his own path. Yeah. Vaughan, Vaughan Williams is certainly different. But I mean, even when you get to something like Britain's War Requiem, it's it's stands apart in some way. Um, do you think there's just something in the in the water in Great Britain that makes things come out differently or something? There, um, it, you know what? It probably has something to do with the fact that Britain for so many years has been Protestant, whereas in uh, the continental countries, even Germany, where you have some Protestants, they, the Catholic um, culture is very important. And this has very practical effects about what composers getting commissioned to write church music as opposed to writing for um, the concert hall or for the opera house. And, and so it might have to do with the kinds of works that were commissioned uh, as much as anything. But the, uh, it's true, British music has always had um, a, a, uh, some sp special attributes. I, I know <laughs> a, an American composer who said to me once, well, don't you know with British music, what you hear as British music, it's because they constantly use an interval of the fourth. The fourth keeps getting used over and over and over again. And when you hear that, you think, oh, that's British music. I, I doubt it's that simple, but <laughs> this yeah, fellow you know, is convinced. Um, well, I've, I've heard a lot of fourths in Beethoven and also. <laughs> but, that's a, but I guess when you come right down to it, I mean, French music is its own, has its own language in a way. And yes. American music, certainly. So I guess it's, I guess it could be said of, of a lot of different countries. You know what, Barry, uh, somebody, and I can't think of his name at the moment, has done a lot of research uh, into the work of um, Dvorak and Janacek and shown pretty concretely that many of their rhythms are derived from the Czech language. And there could be some, this has an area of thinking and research that hasn't been done much, but there can be, as you say, French music is uh, manifestly different from German music. Part of it may be the inflection. And you know, um, you know, Manfred Hanek, the, the conductor? Right. He said that when he conducts a Brahms work with German orchestras, he, uh, he says they play it in a way that reflects the Hamburg accent. And he said, if you then go on to play 
a Mahler work or a Strauss work, you have to remind them that these have a Viennese accent. And he says that you can hear it in the music. Um, I saw a, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a nice video with him where someone said, is it that pronounced? And he he said something with a Pomberg accent and then said the same thing in German with Viennese accent. And it almost sounded like two different languages. Because Viennese is almost inflected as like like a Scandinavian. Right. You know, it has re a real lilt to it. And, sure. and that's you hear that more often in Strauss and Mahler than you do in Brahms. <laughs> so And I guess if there were more I guess if there were more Swiss composers, we would hear music that had the Swiss German inflection, which is completely yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. But that's well, something that people have just started to think about in recent years. So well, um, that's really fascinating. But I should say most people who write about Elgar don't really see him as an entirely British uh, composer because he had such roots in uh, Germanic music. And, um, uh, you know, he be, in the 20 years before he wrote Garantius, he was working as a violinist, an itinerant violinist, and also conducting the local orchestras, which were not up to much, but he, he, he got some experience as a conductor. And, um, you know, they played a lot of Beethoven, they played a lot of um, Mozart, they played Spohr, they played Mendelssohn. And one concert I wish I had gone to, um, Dvorak came uh, to England and performed his Stabat Mater, and, and Elgar was uh, in the second violins. So you got to see wow. Dvorak and Elgar in the same concert, live. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think that continental music had a big effect on Elgar. The other thing that had an effect on him, and you see that in the score of Grantius, Elgar had one real rare distinction as a composer. He was the only composer I know who could play at least one instrument from every group in the orchestra. He played the piano, of course. He played the violin, but he also played the bassoon, and he also played the trombone. So he knew the mechanics of the, the different orchestra groups. And this is one reason musicians love to play Elgar, because he never asks them to play anything impossible, you know, because he knows the limitations of each instrument and he operates in a kind of optimal way within those limitations. Um, and that's why I mean, the first thing you notice if you listen to five minutes of Garantius is um, how, how rich the orchestral textures are and how you're hearing uh, the different parts of the orchestra emerge. You hear the brass break through, you hear the woodwinds uh, break through the orchestra uh, and um, uh it's you know really an important part of the Elgar sound that you're aware that this is not just strings playing. You you hear it. He got this uh, largely from Dvorak. He studied Dvorak scores, and he said we found that um, in the local orchestra if we wanted to play Dvorak and we didn't have all the parts. If we didn't have a player for every part. We couldn't play the work because if you left that one second violin out, it, there was a hole in it. Yeah, <laughs> and he sure. said, with most composers, no problem. You, you don't notice it because they, most composers write mainly um, countering one group, you know, the, the, the strings versus the woodwinds. But with Dvorak and Elgar, it's, it may be, this, you may have a dialogue between the a second violinist and a and uh, the second clarinet. And uh, if you don't have, if they're not present, you have a problem. <laughs> so, well, um, but um, the other thing that makes this work unusual is the, the, and maybe this is one reason people have a problem with it, that the work is very emotionally intense. This is not a, the kind of work that you would want to listen to uh, 
every other week in your life. It takes a lot out of you to perform it and just to listen to it. Uh, the, the climax of part two, uh, no, part one, which is the tenor part, is this pro uh, profession of faith by this very desperate man, uh, well aware of the fact that he, his strength is failing. And he sings the uh, verses. When he gets to the third verse, it's marked in Italian, piagendo, which means as though, as though weeping. And you know, that, the piagendo, you know, Barry, piagendo is not an expressive marking that you see very often. No, no. <laughs> but no. you asked about whether this is a mystical work when we were discussing it the other day. And my first thought, well, I'd, it seems so emotionally grounded. I don't know if you could call it mystical, but the first expressive mark it is marking is lento mystico. So uh, Elgar thought, yes, in the in those opening bars, which always reminds me of the clouds moving over the landscape of the English Midlands, which Elgar loved and and knew so well because uh, he loved to walk. And while riding Garantius, he got his first bicycle. So as he was uh, writing this work and orchestrating it, he was riding all over the, the <laughs> hill uh, in that area where he spent that summer in the border of uh, Worcestershire and Herefordshire, which is a lovely part of England still, very rural still. So can I ask you something a sure. little different? Okay. Yeah. So, and... You know, don't answer this if it doesn't seem to make sense, but looking at yourself and your way of looking at the world as being so intimately involved with this piece, has it changed your outlook on the world and life and spirituality and all that kind of stuff? Uh, you know what? I think the honest answer is it must have. <laughs> okay. It must have. And I'm not, I haven't asked myself that question explicitly. But um, I think, yes, I, I think so. And I, I think I know, because when you suggested that we talk about this, I, I hadn't heard the work for a while. So I started listening to it again. And um, I found it very, very moving to listen to. And when, when you've known the work for 40 years, as I've known this one, and you listen to it again, and you still have such a strong emotional reaction. You know that it's touching something important. And I think what it's touching is, and what makes, this is why the work is popular, I think, in the UK. The theme of this piece is the most universal theme one could have. The theme is the one aspect of life it's absolutely universal, is death. I mean, we're, some of us become surgeons, some of us become baseball players, some of us get elected to public office. But um, the one thing that we all experience is, is death. And also, um, it's the one thing that we can't know anything about. So when, um, in fact, you know, it's very interesting. And may, I think that uh, strangely enough, my interest in flamenco from Spain has helped me understand why Garantius has such a strong effect on me and so, on some other people. There's this idea, Barry, in flamenco of duende. And what duende means, uh, it has roots that have a different meaning, but when it's used today, what it means is um, an awareness of how death how near death is for all of us at any moment. And a, a flamenco uh, performer would tell you, unless you have a sense of the nearness of death, you can't really create any serious art. You can only create light entertainment because what happens when you admit to yourself that death is a real possibility any moment, that raises the stakes of anything that you do in the way of music or poetry. And um, I think that uh, Garantius has, has 
helped me understand that the importance of that element in the best of music and the best of, of literature. I think so. Mm -hmm. Boy, what a what an answer. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, go I'll ahead. Now you you may want to edit this out later. <laughs> no. but, Go I have to tell you a great story about uh, that uh, Lorca Garcia Federico Garcia Lorca described um, this um, flamenco singer, an older woman, probably in her sixties, was performing at a little club, and um, she didn't think much of the audience. She said, "These, I'm not giving my best to these folks. They're <laughs> talking to one another. They're drinking. They're eating. They they, they don't deserve it." She started to sing and someone shouted out, why don't you go back to Paris, which in Andalusia is the ultimate insult because it means that you're singing, you're singing uh, in a very superficial decorative way, but you're not singing anything important. So she started, she told the guitarist to stop. She started singing again. There was an elderly man in the audience who's listening with a glass in his hand and he got so overwrought that he broke the glass. And some people came to his aid and you know bandaged his hand and said, sir, what can we do for you? And she, he said, you know what you can do for me? Ask her to keep singing. Oh. <laughs> and Lorca loved that story just as a, a, a way to a demarcation between art that is a diversion and art the kind of art that really we can't get through life without. So, <laughs> Boy, that's a great story, too. My father, who, as you know, was a painter, had a favorite saying, which I think was his own. He said, art is that useless thing we cannot live without. <laughs> that's kind of I think that's it. Yeah. So I wanted to ask the on classical archives, when people's curiosity is piqued and they want to go listen to Dream of Garantius. There's a recording on with Andrew Davis and the BBC on Shandos, which is on classical archives. So um and well adjacent to the window in which this interview appears on our blog, I'll have a link to that so people can go there and see that. So I wanted to ask you two things. One was if you have any comments on that recording. And also, you were telling me not long ago that there's a new recording coming out, which is very much to be looked forward to. Yes. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's so. the best sentence I just said. But um, so I guess that's a two part question about both the Andrew Davis recording and also this new one that's coming along. Yeah. Well, Andrew Davis is a very committed Elgar conductor. He's conducted almost every major Elgar work, I think. And uh, he does a wonderful job with the score. Sarah Connolly is fantastic in the role of the angel. And uh, um, the um, now I should have the CD in front of me. The, the tenor is uh, Stuart Skelton, isn't it? I yes, think it is. It's yeah. wonderful as well. But um, there also is a digital version by Richard Hickox that's very good. The reason I chose this one is that it probably has the best audio engineering of any Garantius that's ever been done. And since the score, uh, both the choral parts and the instrumental parts are so complex, the textures are so multi-layered, you really need the best audio engineers you can get, and Chandos has them for this recording. So um, this will let people hear um, everything that's in the score. And um, yeah, actually the score was reissued two years ago, and it's a beautiful thing actually, uh, with um, every source uh, that could be tracked down, we know where Many, many of the sketches for the work are and a very fascinating introduction by John Norris that recounts um, the letters going back and forth between Elgar and his editor as he was writing the work from January 1900 to 
uh, till August of 1900. So it's uh, that's uh, people I probably have to go to a university library to get hold of that, but that's worth looking for. Um, but what's coming up, if people know the name Paul McCreesh, they might know that he's famous for doing kind of fresh, bringing a fresh look to very well-known works like, like Elijah by Mendelssohn. And uh, last summer he recorded Garantius with um, Anna Stefani, who was an Anglo-French mezzo, and Nicky Spence, who was a Scottish tenor, and um, an orchestra that goes by the name of Gabrielli. Uh, and the choral, I don't know all of the choral groups that were used, but the core of it was the Polish National Choir, which has done a lot of British music, surprisingly enough. Um, so that's gonna be on Signum Records in April, and that should be well worth waiting for, I think. Terrific. Any performances, live performances coming up in the States or any place that you know of? You know, it's a real barometer for, you know, everything we've been talking about. There is a performance um, later this year in Milwaukee, one, and then in Europe, you can practically hear this work every week or two. There are performances from Belfast to Helsinki, <laughs> lots of performances of Garantius in uh, this spring and summer in Europe. Um, but for Americans, the best thing is to to get a CD, and um, uh, you know all of the C all of the CDs that I know of uh, have the full libretto, which is only about half of the poem that Newman wrote. But Elgar very judiciously cut out the parts that would not work as as musical as as, as sung language, and. Um, uh, you know, so no matter how much is going on uh, in the bar of music, if people have the words in front of them, they can they can follow along. So that's that's very useful. Sure. And I would also, um, because we are classical archives, encourage people to look at the look for the Andrew Davis recording right now on classical archives, and I'm sure there are other recordings as well available. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, two dozen, actually. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking on classical archives, I should have done my homework and figured out how many recordings there are. But people just do a search for yes. this work or the composer and they'll find it. Boy, this has been a fantastic conversation. Is there Are there topics that we haven't gotten to that you would like to, another log you would like to throw on the fire, do you think? Um, just one thing, it's, it's slightly technical, but it's, I think, very interesting. If you listen to um, Garantius, one thing that on a single hearing, you'll, you're, whether you know much about music or not, one thing that's going to strike you is that there's a lot of different melodies but they all seem to be closely related. And yet you can tell them apart. You, and, and this is important because some of them reappear in different contexts in part two, and you recognize them. And Elgar was, first of all, he had perfect pitch, which I think people with, per, as you know, many composers didn't have perfect pitch. Scriabin, for example, did not. Um, you don't need to have perfect pitch to be a, comp a composer, but I think if you do, it makes you extra sensitive to every time there's a key change. And in Garantius, the prelude is in D minor. The 40 minutes of music works its way to D major, but it goes through eight keys on the way. And if you know the circle of fifths, it just goes right around the circle of fifths in a counterclockwise direction so that each change of key has one more flat than the key in front of it. And it's an ingenious thing, but Elgar knew that you know, most people were never going to notice this, but when you listen, the music seems to evolve in a way that you can't quite put your finger on, but you know it's happening. Everything that happens seems to be related 
to what you just heard and seems to foreshadow what you're about to hear. And that's one of the things, just sheer music. If you uh, listen to this, there actually is one recording with the words in German. If you played that and you didn't understand a word, I think you would still get a sense of what was happening dramatically because of the way the, the key changes would pull you along. Is there some point in the work in which he starts to add sharps instead of flats and takes you up uh, through yes, the yes, 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 in, in, in part two. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, right. And the other thing, I think that the only thing that uh, we haven't discussed is the the sheer imaginative power of this work, especially in part two. In part two, and we'll let's take um, Newman at his word and, and believe that this is a dream and not actually something happening in the other world. This is a dream of someone still on earth thinking about what may happen to him next. Um, the soul uh, of this man finds himself in another world. And um, Newman has wonderful words for it. And Elgar's music grows very organically out of it. And what uh, the singer sings is, I hear no more the busy beat of time, nor does one moment differ from the next. And I mean, what a <laughs> way to set a scene, right? And yeah. then encounters, this is one element of humor. I, I, I think Elgar hoped that we would get this. Uh, he sees this figure approaching him and he says, um, I want to speak to him. And then the angel starts singing, and of course it's a mezzo. So it's not a him, it's a okay. her. Being okay. an angel, he can't tell that. But um, um, the angel sings this, again, this incredible alleluia, because the soul that she was charged with guarding through life, guarding from mortal sin that would doom him to, you know, to, to hell, um, has managed to, to guard him safely into the next world. And, um, you know, for all the complexity of the score, that, that alleluia is, uses the simplest possible musical terms. Um, and then later on, of course, you have the whole scene where the angel leads this soul into the gates, through the gates of heaven. And it's just amazing um, musically, uh, really worthy of anything Wagner ever did. Just a, astounding uh, musical power and uh, radiance. That's the, the only thing you can, the only word that does it justice, I think. Boy. The creative mind is a is a fabulous thing. It it is, <laughs> it is, um, and uh, you know this is somebody we're talking about somebody who wanted to be a violinist, um, couldn't really afford to study. He he saved some money and went and took some lessons in London and a few in Germany, but um, you know he had to make a, his first job was conducting the orchestra in an insane asylum because they believed it was actually pretty enlightened. They, and we know this now, that when people have dementia, one of the best things you can do for them is play very structured music, like a work by Mozart. It actually, it, it provides a framework for thought that they cannot provide themselves in daily life. And so uh, as, as, one of Elgar's uh, biographers, Percy Young, said Elgar started at the very bottom rung of the British <laughs> musical world. Uh, and and it was very, it was funny in later life, if uh, Elgar was in London at, a, you know, some wealthy person's home, very fancy dining room with servants waiting on them, and he thought things were getting too stuffy, he would say, well, when I was at the asylum, what we used to do is... <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a good icebreaker. <laughs> uh -huh.
That's great. It reminds me that supposedly Alfred Hitchcock had things he would say in, when he was in an elevator with strangers. You'd say say outlandish things that weren't true just to... Because he knew it better <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. You'd say, you'd say things like, and the, the man was was lying in the street, dying, and blood was everywhere, you know, and, and even though it was complete nonsense, you know, yes. just to uh, engage people. Oh, yes. well. Make, see if they're paying attention. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, I, th I think that's a fabulous interview. Well, thank you. I yeah giving me the chance to, to talk about this work. I love it. And uh, I think many other Americans would love it too if they get a chance to hear it. Let's see if we can, as they say in the South, hit them upside the head and get them to start paying, <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> but thanks a million. So I'll this will be live in a few days on Classical Archives. And um, I know that the people out there watching will just love this. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Barry. Great to talk with you. Yeah, you as well. This is a great conversation. So take care of yourself and thanks so much. Thanks. Take care. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.